Let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you for who you are. But Father, among all these, we bring ourselves. We pray that you would open our hearts and lives to your word, that we, each of us, might just fall in love again with your word, your written word and your word incarnate, our Messiah, Yeshua, in whose name we do pray. Amen. Well, we're continuing our study of the book of Revelation, and we are in session 17, focusing on chapter 12, one of the most pivotal chapters, not just in the book of Revelation, in the entire Bible. It, it's going to it's some bring, bring to focus some issues for all of us. Now, to re, I want to remind you, we are in that third section of this book. It ha, it, it, the book itself has given us our outline. John is told to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be metatauta hereafter. The, f- the things which John had seen by the end of chapter 1 was the vision of the Lord, a, a post-resurrection uh, uh, vision of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, he, that detail, and, and the descriptors that are used there are then used as linkages throughout the rest of the book. Write things which thou hast seen, and the things which are. And the most important of part of the whole entire book are chapters 2 and 3 for you and me. The seven churches that profile all of us, all of us individually, all the churches we've ever been in, and perhaps most provocatively, a history of the church in advance. Those, if you're going to really master chapter, the two chap, those two chapters are the most important part of the entire book. But we're in this third section, the things which shall be after this, the things which follows the churches. In chapters 4 through 22 is the rest of the book. And that's obviously where we're at in this session. And uh, we believe, to give you a perspective here, that the rapture of the church is prefigured in the first verse of chapter 4. Where John says, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be metatauta. Metatauta, after these things. That's the Greek word that opens that verse, and also is the milestone that launches the third section of the book. And uh, we're, we, by now we've very con- we're very conscious of the heptatic structure, the sevenfold structure of the book where Jesus receives the seven sealed scroll and opens those seals one at a time. We notice in each of these series of sevens, there's six and then a parenthesis, sort of a a catch-your-breath chapter. We had six seals opened, and then there was a parenthesis, which there were 12,000 sealed of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then the seventh seal opens, and we have again seven trumpets, again a series of seven, and... uh, Between the 6th and the 7th, there is again a parenthesis. This time, it's a lengthy parenthesis of five chapters. 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. And when these are concluded, the 7th trumpet will be blown, and it leads to seven bowls of wrath poured out. And by now, we're sensitized to this sevenfold structure with a parenthesis between the 6th and 7th. And we'll note, if you're careful, just a verse or two uh, between um, the 6th and 7th bowls. But again, this pattern, this style, if you will, that God uses is instructive. Well, we are in this parenthesis between the 6th and 7th trumpets. And that's the section that we're in now. In the, last, pre- in the previous section, we talked about chapters 10 and 11, the little book and our need to digest it. The seven thunders, mysterious thunders, whose words were understood by John, but he, didn't, he was not allowed to write them down. Very mysterious. And we talked about chapter 11, where we had the temple. The future temple is there discussed, and these strange two witnesses. Now, when we talked about the temple last time, you may recall that uh, the temple will be rebuilt. This is not the millennial temple. It's a temple that has a different destiny. It's a temple that's going to be dedicated, but it will be, its destiny is to be desecrated by the coming world leader. And we'll talk a lot about him next time. But in any case, we know this temple is going to be standing because Jesus, Paul, and John all make reference to it. And last time we reviewed the three viewpoints. The traditional view, still embraced by the rabbinical authorities in Israel, is that the temple stood where the Dome of the Rock now stands. But most scientists um, uh, feel that that's strictly a tradition. Uh, Dr. Asher Kaufman, the head of the Hebrew, uh, 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 Hebrew professor in, the universe, in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem, uh, quite an expert on the temple, he, his, he's famous for his conjecture that it's to the north, and uh, we talked about that. But there's also 
a lot of the current thinking by people who are scientifically oriented, there's a lot of evidence accumulating that the temple actually stood to the south. And uh, so we discussed the pros and cons of each of those three views. We won't know which one's correct until there's an opportunity to do serious archaeology on the Temple Mount. The other issue that came up last time, just to refresh your memory, was the identities of these two strange witnesses. And different authorities have different uh, uh, views as to who they are. But we took the view that the first one is Elijah. Most authorities agree to that for lots of reasons. And uh, because of, there's two, they have four distinct powers. Two of those powers were unique to Elijah, calling fire down from heaven and the ability to shut heaven so it doesn't rain. And we went through all of that. The other one, we lean to the view that it was Moses for a number of reasons. Uh, he's the one that t can turn water into blood, and he also called down plagues. And these four powers of these two witnesses are conspicuously identified with both Elijah and Moses. And we went through the other reasons why we think this all fits the pattern, but um, that was the main top topic last time. Now tonight, we're taking not two chapters, just one. We're going to take chapter 12, which introduces... The woman, a man-child, and the dragon. And understanding this chapter is crucial, not just to understand the book of Revelation, but to really understand what's going on in the Bible and God's plan. Now, when we got in chapter 11, as it closed, we encountered one of, of, of seven great openings. I mentioned there are great openings. You'll never exhaust the number of sevens. The, every time you think you've made a list, of all the sevens, just in the book of Revelation, I'm talking about the Bible, just the book of Revelation, uh, you'll find another one, either grammatically or structurally or some other way. Uh, there were seven, the door opened in heaven chapter 4, the seals were opened in chapter 6, the abuso was opened in chapter 9, the temple of God was opened in chapter 11, verse 19, which really belongs to this chapter, which is one reason I put this in here as part of the review. The tabernacle of testimony is open in chapter 15, heaven is open in chapter 19, and the books of judgment are open in chapter 20. And how many of those are there? Seven. Good guess. Yeah, all right. The temple of God is open in chapter 11, and I believe it really, it's the last verse of chapter 11, it really belongs in chapter 12 in a sense. It said, and the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. Now, very frequently in the book of Revelation, we have lightnings and thunderings and great hail and earthquake. But uh, the Ark of the Testament, this confuses many people because we see the Ark of the Testament. Where is it? In heaven. You need to understand it's always been there. We're going to go on in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she being with child cried, traveling in both birth, and pained to be delivered. So this opens chapter 12. A great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. What on earth is going on here? And she being with a child cried, traveling in birth, and pained to be delivered. We're going to, what I'm going to do is I want to read through, it's a short chapter, so I'm going to read through the chapter and then we'll come back and analyze what it apparently uh, is saying here. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And, and these are not uh, Stephanos. There's two works in the Greek. Stephanos is a victor, the, word, the name Stephen comes from Stephanos. It, it's a victor's crown a wreath that is given to an athlete who has excelled, analogous, if you will, to a gold medal at the Olympics. The diadem is a kingly crown and implies rulership, and that's the crown that's being used here. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Grisly graphics here. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. 
And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we have the woman and the dragon as the principal players here. This is one of the most important chapters in the Bible, not just in the book of Revelation. It's gonna, we're going to review the enigma of Israel, without which the Bible cannot be fully understood. The great tragedy in the Christian church today is that most churches have no understanding of the role of Israel in God's plan. It's really quite astonishing. If you go into almost any pastor's library, you'll find a set of books, typically a dozen or two dozen books, called Systematic Theology, by whichever background that pastor happens to come from. There's several, obviously a number of different classic renderings of that. But what's interesting of those, although they may have different views on certain topics, if you look at the table of contents, every one of them has virtually the same table of contents. They have different topics. They'll have bibliology, the study of the Bible. They'll have soteriology, the study of salvation. They'll have pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. Christology, the study of Christ, and so on. Anthropology, the study of man. And, and the field of theology has its divisions. And the table of contents of any one of these classical, systematic theology texts, every one of them has something missing, and what's missing is a subject that constitutes five-sixths of the entire Bible. Every one of these studies of so-called systematic theology has omitted what a topic, a focus, if you will, didn't omit the topic because it's, it's laced through there, but they don't focus on, have no focus. They focus on every key element you can think of, but they don't focus on this particular element. You know what it is? Israel. Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum did his, got his Ph.D. thesis by pointing that out. He has a book called Israelology, The Missing Link in Systematic Theology. It's a big book. It's worth having. It's, uh, it's outstanding. But the point is, unless you, underst unless you understand God's purpose and the destiny of Israel, you will have a, a confused view of what the Bible is really all about. And chapter 12 in the book of Revelation is a summary of the essence of that topic. It really begins, as I mentioned, the, 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 uh, the real temple is not in, uh, the real temple is in heaven, not on the earth. The real ark is in heaven, not on the earth. Let's not confuse ourselves. Moses simply had a replica that represents the throne of God. And you can find plenty of passages. They'll be in your notes if you want to go into this. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, we're told, uh, it says, who serve us uh, unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. See, if I was directing the Ten Commandments movie, I would have had Charlton Heston come down from the mount with two tables of stone under one arm and a group of engineering blueprints in the other. Because what he got up on the mount was not just the Ten Commandments. He got explicit uh, uh, specifications for this portable sanctuary we call the tabernacle and, and all the devices that are in it. And we're, we're exp it's explained in the New Testament that the, he, he was shown the pattern of the things that were to be made when he got down the mountain. And, of course, they did. But the Ark of the Covenant 
sacred though it is, is but a replica of an actual one in heaven. And uh, that's, that causes a lot of confusion. Something you should be sensitive to is the mercy seat is not part of the Ark of the Covenant. They're always mentioned separately. It happens to sit on top of the Ark of the Covenant. But you'll notice the scripture always treats them separately. In fact, the Holy of Holies is defined as the location of its mercy seat. Now, obviously, it's on the ark, so they're both in there. But it's interesting that uh, uh, God is viewed as being enthroned above the ark of the covenant. Second Samuel 6, 2, David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name, uh, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. He's enthroned above the cherubim. That's the role of the mercy seat. And one of the things that's quite fascinating is that the real issue before uh, uh, us as, as researchers is not where is the ark of the covenant, because Jeremiah 3.16 says the ark will no longer be remembered nor come to mind. The issue, and this will come as a shock even to the Ethiopians, the issue is not the Ark of the Covenant, it's the mercy seat. We suspect from about 30 scriptures that that seat will end up being the throne from which God rules when he rules from Mount Zion. So you can chase that down as a separate study. Let's just move on. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, I would say something like uh, uh, four out of five commentators on this verse try to make the woman the church. And uh, I love the way Chuck Smith summarizes our view. If this is the church, she's in big trouble because she's pregnant. The woman here is being figured as having a child. And the, the church is always depicted in the scripture as the virgin bride of Christ. And, um, but without going down all those speculations, the best way to interpret the Bible is by the Bible. One of the things that I hope you get from our studies is a respect, in fact an awe, for the integrity of design. If you get nothing else from our studies than an appreciation that every detail of every book is there by, a pl by design, deliberate, skillful engineering. Even though it's penned by 40 guys, these 66 books are an integrated message, which means something like this should have its clue somewhere else within the Bible, not in somebody's commentary or in the Zodiac or anything else, okay? Although the Zodiac may be here in some surprising ways. Let's see what the Bible says. Uh, there are four women in the book of Revelation, by the way, Two good ones and two bad ones. Jezebel, remember her from the letter to Thyatira, uh, a, a, a symptomatic of evil, uh, evil doctrine. We'll encounter the harlot in chapters 17 and 18. We have this woman here that we're going to explore, and, and obviously we have the bride that will show up in Revelation 19 and 21. Four women. The first two are uh, uh, of, of doubtful character. I shouldn't say doubtful. They're obviously of <laughs> clearly bad character. And uh, the last two, of course, are, are positive ones. Now, the, obviously, the, the bride of Christ is always presented, like in, in 2 Corinthians 11 and elsewhere, as the espoused virgin. Let's go back and let J uh, Jacob himself interpret this for us, because he has. You may recall in Genesis 37, Joseph has these dreams, right? Joseph dreamed a dream, he told it to his brothers. And they hated him yet the more. He just got in his fancy coat that Jacob made. It may not have been many colors. That's a whole other debate. But the point is, he got this, obviously, uh, this uh, fancy coat, and the, the brothers already envied him for that. But now he has this dream, and he told it to the brothers. Having it's all right, he couldn't help that, but he tells his brothers. He should have had probably a little more <laughs> um, sensitivity. Anyway, he said to them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose. It also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. Now that went over great with his brothers. You can imagine. His brother said to them, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? <laughs> or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. It keeps moving on. Next verse. He dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren. He said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. 
And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. He obviously is one of the, there's, there's twelve, he's one of them, but the eleven stars and the sun and the moon uh, yield to him. That's in verse 9. Sun, moon, and twelve stars. And by the way, what you and I call the zodiac, after the temple of Dendra, from which astronomy gets its labeling for the heavens, and that's fine, um, the Hebrew equivalent is the Metzeroth. And it may surprise you to know those 12 constellations in the sky have Hebrew names and relate to the 12 tribes of Israel, by the way. So the Matzeroth is here depicted, strangely enough. But verse 10, Joseph tells it to his father, Jacob. He, he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee on the earth? See, what's implicit in Jacob's rebuttal here is, is that he is interpreting the dream for us. Joseph's dream depicted the family. Sun, the moon, Jacob and his wife, and the twelve brothers. And those twelve brothers uh, the 12, lead to the twelve tribes. Those twelve tribes have symbols in the Matzeroth. There's a whole study of that I encourage you to explore called the signs in the heavens, but that's a whole other thing. So, uh, now the brethren, of course, envied him, and, but his father observed the saying. But same thing... <laughs> Just like Mary and Jesus, there's some things that happened she didn't understand, but she just kept it in her heart. The same thing Jacob, he, 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 he re rebuked Joseph, his brothers envied Joseph, but his father observed the sayings. In other words, he thought about it and remembered it. So who is this woman? Israel is described all through the Old Testament as a woman in travail. Isaiah 54 and 66, and Jeremiah 3, 6 and following, the whole chapter 3 of Jeremiah. Micah 4, Micah 5, you can find, these are just a small group of the allusions to Israel as a woman in travail. Now the woman in Revelation 12 gives birth to the man-child. The church does not give birth to the Messiah. There's no, the model doesn't work. The, the woman is clearly Israel. She's Israel in a very strange way. She's Israel in the sense that she began in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Because that's where Jesus gets one of his titles, the seed of the woman. What woman? Seed of Eve. And the chain that starts there. And, uh, and you can follow that chain all through the scripture. So this is Israel, not the church. Remember Isaiah 9, 6? You see it on the Christmas cards every year. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's Isaiah talking in a Jewish context. Unto us a son is born, human, a child, a, a son, excuse me, a, a child is born, a son is given. You have the, both the humanity and the deity, Jesus Christ, uh, linked together in that verse. One of the titles of Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. As, uh, from Genesis 3.15 and elsewhere. And the whole messianic line there begins what I call the scarlet thread starts at Genesis 3 when God declares war on Satan. Remember that. Satan didn't declare war on God. God declared war on Satan. It was his initiative. Now, as we go through the book of Revelation, there are a number of times that we'll encounter viewpoints that are very controversial. And many of those are quite um, personal. It shouldn't be an area of division. And uh, the, we would do a disservice by not calling your attention to these various controversial viewpoints. And uh, some of them are not critical. Some of them are rather critical. There is a viewpoint that has the label replacement theology that you need to be aware of. And uh, there is a widely held view that when Israel rejected her Messiah that she forfeited the promises to her. And those promises that are here discussed devolve then upon the church. There's a concept that's taught in many places that the church somehow has become spiritual Israel. This is the viewpoint of the Roman Catholic Church, and this is also the viewpoint of many of the major denominations that derive from the Reformation from the Roman Catholic Church.
The great tragedy today is that viewpoint is widely taught throughout the denominational churches in America and in the English-speaking world. It happens to be not biblical. That's not a problem. Many of our views that we might hold personally might not be quite in conformance to the Bible because of through ignorance or whatever. This one is a little dangerous because it makes God a liar. To hold this view impugns the character of God. And the reason is, is because God went out of his way throughout the Old Testament to repeatedly reconfirm very explicit promises to Israel and to imply that there's somehow fine print or, or that, that they're not going to be fulfilled is to impugn his character. So it, Israel appears 75 times in the New Testament in 73 verses. And I'm going to suggest to you that in every one of those places, it's referring to the nation Israel. There's one verse, Galatians 6.16, that some will say is an exception. Even there, if you understand the Greek, it's clearly Israel. It refers to national Israel. There is a, in Galatians 6.16, there's that chi in the Greek, which clearly from the grammar indicates that it prevents any possibility of it being synonymous with the church and Israel together. But set aside that one technicality, uh, that's still overwhelming. There are major problems with this view. Why am I emphasizing this? Because first of all, the promises God that we're talking about, that God gave Israel, were unconditional. God went out of his way to demonstrate that no way did Abraham have anything to contribute to that pact between them. Paul, in his definitive statement of Christian doctrine, recalled the book of Romans, hammers away for three chapters that God is not finished with Israel. Romans 9, 10, and 11 talks about Israel's past, present, and future. And the whole point of that is that to demonstrate that God is not through with Israel. He, he, these are all going to be fulfilled. In order to understand anything prophetically, you have to really understand the 70-week prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. And clearly, between the 69th and 70th week, there's a verse 26, which details a, a, an interval during which the church occurs. The church is not on the earth during the first 69 weeks, by definition. And it clearly is not in the 70th. It's in that parenthesis. You need to understand that. It's only in that interval between the 69th and 70th week that the church is on the earth. You need to check that out and understand that. But one of the simplest things to focus on is that Jesus has to fulfill the explicit promise that Gabriel gave Mary in Luke chapter 1. Uh, to make that, he would, that her child would take David's throne. How did all this thing start? How did we go from Augustine to Auschwitz to Armageddon? It all started in a sense with origins. He had a style of hermeneutics. He was a great writer and a very, very prominent early church father. But he admonished, uh, he, he uh, advocated a uh, allegorical interpretation of the scripture. That was his, his style, uh, allegorical interpretations. Augustine picked up on that. And from that, he developed a view called amillennial eschatology. We're going to talk a great deal about this when we get to chapter 20, because it'll come up. But basically, you need to understand the classical biblical view that Jesus was going to come back to dispossess the planet Earth of the bad guys to set up his perfect rule. That was not a popular theme if you were a state-paid pastor. It was hard for you being on the salary of the empire uh, when, you know, after the third century when the, the, the church became the, the uh, official religion of the Roman Empire that... Um, to, to hammer away how evil the empire is and that Christ is going to come to rid the world of all these bad rulers. That wasn't politically correct. So under Augustine, he, he bent that around, put a different spin on it, that, God is, that Jesus is going to rule in our hearts. And it was a way of, of, of avoiding the embarrassment uh, with the people who are paying the paychecks. So this le leads to an amillennial eschatology, and that's colored by the medieval church their, their insatiable quest for power that we reviewed when we were talking about the letter to Thyatira and so forth. The Reformation comes along and does a marvelous job returning to the Word of God as its authority in contrast to man's traditions. 
And their focus was primarily on what we would call soteriology, salvation, salvation by faith. They did a great job. People willingly were burned at the stake in their adherence to sound doctrine. So we should praise God for that. But the Reformation was incomplete. They failed to address some of the other issues, eschatology being one of them. And so the eschatology of Augustine, from the Catholic background, continued and infested the theology of most of the Protestant churches that derive from that. And that led to the Holocaust in Germany. If you want to blame someone for the Holocaust in Germany, blame the silent pulpits that didn't speak out. There's some very embarrassing writings by Martin Luther on this subject that is an embarrassment to this day. The Holocaust in Germany derived from this replacement theology point of view because it, be it turns out to drive people to anti-Semitism. And it's going to lead to the next Holocaust, which we call the Great Tribulation. And so we go from Augustine to Auschwitz to Armageddon. Why? Because of this satanic doctrine. Let's go on. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. These idioms will sound very familiar to you because they feel like they're lifted right out of Daniel chapter 7. You've heard these terms several times in the Old Testament already. And speaking of this red dragon, we're going to find out who he is because he's identified for us in chapter verse 9. <laughs> And his, his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. You see the portrayal here. This adversary, this red dragon, is out to get the child as soon as it's born. He's not finished yet. The great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The word devil derives from a Greek term for slanderer. The word Satan comes from a Hebrew word, which means adversary. But they're obviously the same guy. They're equivalent labels, whether you call them the devil or whether you call them Satan. And I think most of you, I hope, are sophisticated enough biblically to realize that the devil is not wearing red underwear, carrying a pitchfork, ruling over a place called hell. Hell is where he is destined to be tormented. And he's not ruling anything there. At, uh, it's, anyway, uh, we're victims of English literature, and uh, Dante and Goethe and others have, have uh, developed a view that has come into the popular culture that Satan has two objectives, and one objective is that you don't believe he exists, or on the other hand, if you do, he goes the other way, and, and, that, and, and be terrified of him, and the truth is between those two extremes. Anyway, that serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Every place you run into ish, uh, allusions to Satan, you'll recognize the primary modality that he operates in is through deception. That's what he did in Genesis 3. That's what he does every place he goes. He deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. It was from that verse that a third of the stars fell with him that we get the view that one-third of the angels were cast out with him. And I like those odds. That means for every one of them, there's two of the good guys. At least, huh? And... Uh, I was quite surprised as I grew in my Bible studies to discover that guardian angels are biblical. That sounds like one of those terms that just emerges from traditions. No, in Matthew 18, um, Jesus makes allusions to the to guardian angels. So every one of you have at least one. I'm sure I've got several. Some of the, yeah. So, call the devil and Satan. And she, this is the woman again, brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Does that phrase sound familiar to you? It should. It occurs four places in the scripture at least. Who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to, unto God and to his throne. Now, <laughs> for many, many years, as I read verse 5, 
I recognized, of course, that the woman is Israel. The man-child is who? Jesus Christ. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And I just took for granted. That's an allusion to what? The ascension, right? You picture Acts chapter 1. You see him going up there and there's two men watching. Those same two men are the ones at the resurrection. Those two men are not angels. They're men. I believe they're Moses and Elijah. But anyway, um, it was G.H. Pember, I believe, back probably like maybe 1914. He was the first that I encountered, at least, that saw this as possibly alluding to something else. Not the ascension, but the rapture. Her child, the body of Christ, was caught up to God in his throne. That could be an allusion to the ascension, no problem. It also might be an allusion to the body of Christ caught up in the rapture, because the word caught up there in the Greek is, guess what? Arpazo. Snatched. The same word that occurs in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Certainly the child is Jesus Christ. You picked up on that. The rule of the rod of, he rules with a rod of iron. You, that's an echo from Psalm 2, where it says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And that's the Son of God there alluded to. And, and Psalm 2 is a, uh, a trialogue between the Father, Holy Spirit, and the Son. You want to diagram that uh, short psalm sometime and figure out who's, who's saying what to whom. Um, we recognize, of course, from our study of Revelation 2 in the letter to Thyatira, he shall rule them with the rod, speaking of Jesus Christ, he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter. They shall be broken in shivers even as I have received from my father. And the adversary of the woman here in this chapter, she brought forth a man child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron and a child who is caught up to God and to his throne. And then uh, we'll find it in Revelation 19, when the big climax and out of his mouth goeth forth a sharp sword, that it, with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who's that? Anyone, anyone have a doubt about that? Okay, no problems. No problem in that identity. So she brought forth a man child to rule all nations with, uh, with a uh, rod of iron, and her child was caught by God. Um, it's interesting because if this is an allusion to the rapture, the next verse is going to talk about the Great Tribulation. And so you could sense then there seems to be a gap of time between verse 5 and verse 6. You follow me? Because verse 5 speaks of Jesus Christ being caught up to heaven. Verse 6 talks about the great tribulation where the woman is going to be dealt with in for 42, 42 months and so forth. So there is an implied gap between verse 5 and 6. That's the same gap you find in Daniel chapter 9 between verse 25, uh, 25 and 27. Verse 26 is an interruption between the 69th week and the 7th week. You follow me? How many of those gaps are there in the Bible? 24. We'll list them in your notes, so you have it as part of your background. But it fascinates me, is not only is it prevalent all through the Scripture, Old and New Testament, uh, another example, when Jesus opens his ministry in uh, uh, Luke 4, and he's in the synagogue of Nazareth, he takes the book of Isaiah, and he finds that place where it is written, and he reads those verses, and then he says, this day is this fulfilled in your ears, you remember? He is reading from Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. But when you study that carefully, and look at Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, and read what Jesus said, he stopped at a comma, closed the book, and said, this day is that fulfilled. That's kind of weird. You go back, what followed the comma? The day of vengeance of our God. It's a whole concatenation of all the phrases that described his ministry, healing the sick and declaring the, uh, God and so forth. But he stops at that comma because part two wasn't fulfilled then. That comma has lasted about 2,000 years. When he comes back, that's what he'll be dealing with, the day of vengeance. So that's another one of those commas, uh, one of these uh, gaps or intervals. What fascinates me, if you make a list from cover to cover of the Bible where those gaps appear, there's 24 of them. And I find that kind of interesting because we went through all that with the 24 elders, didn't we? As being representative of what? The church, which is what that interval is all about. 
So I'll let you run with that in your own studies. But the word caught up is harpazo. It's the same word. It means to seize, carry off by force, to seize on, to claim for one's self eagerly, to snatch out of the way. When Jesus arose in Acts 1, I didn't see, sense that he was being snatched away, taken by force. You follow me? That's the word here. So I think G.H. Pember um, uh, may have something, that this may be an allusion uh, to the rapture, interestingly enough. I wouldn't build a big theological case on it, but I do find it interesting. I've called it to your attention. Then we get verse 6, and the woman fled into the wilderness. See, there's a sudden break here. There's, a, there's an interval of time that's missing. That's what I meant by the interval. The woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Here is this interval of time that is so repetitive in the Old Testament and New Testament. It's called uh, uh, 1260 days, several places. It's called 42 months, several other places. It's called half of a seven-year period in another place. Time, times, the dividing of time. We've covered this several times. Here it is again. It obviously is that, that she's fled in the wilderness during this time that she's going to be um, tried, in effect, or uh, put into a, a, a testing, if you will. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. I want you to notice who's doing the fighting here. It's not Jesus Christ and Satan. By the guy by the name of Koch wrote a book on spiritual warfare many years ago, and the book isn't bad. The title's terrible. The title is Between Christ and Satan. It creates the impression that they're equals. That's nonsense. Who created Satan? Jesus Christ did. It says so in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, without him was not anything made that was made, John tells us, and so forth. They're not, no, this is Michael. There's his offset. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. That's the contest. Who's going to, you know, and prevailed not. That who, did, who didn't prevail? Satan and his angels didn't prevail. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So Michael and his angels succeed. They've got a two-to-one advantage, apparently. Right? That Satan and his gang is cast out. There's some debate among theologians, when did that happen? Did it happen a long time ago? Is it going to happen yet future? I won't get into that debate, because who cares? We know that Satan is very active today, no problem. I don't suspect he's confined to the earth yet. He certainly had access to heaven during the days of Job. That's what chapter 1 of Job's all about. In fact, the scripture tells us he accuses us, you and me, day and night before the Father. That's his activity. Who's your defense counsel? Jesus. Who's the guy that's got the court wired? Jesus. <laughs> that's the way I like those odds too. But there is a point at which they are going to be cast out denied access to heaven. And um, there's different views as to when that happens. It, it doesn't affect us directly. Prevailed is not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So Michael is one of the chief princes, Daniel 10. By the way, he's the only one in the Bible that's labeled an archangel. Jewish tradition says there's seven archangels. They build that on some rabbinical uh, uh, traditions that may be correct, may not. I wouldn't put a bank on it. But Michael is identified in the scripture as an archangel. He's certainly one of the chief princes in Daniel 10. He's called the archangel in Jude chapter 1, or in uh, verse 9 of the only chapter, and 1 Thessalonians 4.16. It's, it's the voice of the archangel that you're going to hear. That's Michael. And... Uh, uh, he is called Daniel's prince, again in Daniel 10. He is always pictured as a warrior. He is a military commander. Not the top guy, that's our Lord. But he is his you know, captain of the host, okay? He fights for the body of Moses. Again, he finds Satan for the body of Moses. He's always fight, if he's fighting an equal, he's fight, or, uh, I won't say an equal, but a peer type guy, it would be uh, always Satan. He fights for the body of Moses in Jude 9. That's a, that's a strange episode. He is said to have fought in the wars of the Lord. I didn't know there were wars of the Lord, but that illusion is in Numbers 21, verse 14. The book of the wars of the Lord. Apparently a lot of them. And uh, Zechariah 14. So the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. 
And it's verse 9 that identifies who he is that we've been talking about all along, but uh, that's, we've, we've anticipated that as we've gone. Now, the red dragon, you can do a study of, the, uh, of uh, Satan. The two pivotal passages are Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. Easy to remember, both multiples of seven. Uh, the origin of Satan is described in Ezekiel 28, and the rebellion in heaven that, G that uh, Satan leads is in Isaiah 14. And this gap, as I mentioned, occurs in uh, Genesis 1-2. There is a gap in Genesis 1-2, some people argue, and that would be one of those 24 probably that we talked about. I won't get into that here. We, we touch upon that in our Genesis commentary. Um, He's the ancient one. He was there from the beginning in Genesis 3. One of the mysteries is when did he fall? He's already fallen in Genesis 3. So he must have fallen sometime prior. And that's where some people build a whole case about the, between the first two verses in the Bible. I won't go down. That. That's not important to us here. Stars are always, in the book of Revelation, are always used as angels. And uh, in Jude 1, uh, uh, verse 13. Um, he is always a deceiver. Deceives the whole world in 2 uh, Corinthians 4. He was a liar from the beginning. There's this marvelous exchange in John 8. You have to listen, read it very carefully so you pick up on it. Because early in chapter 8, the Pharisees cast aspersions on Christ's legitimacy. You have to watch carefully what they're saying. They're saying, we were not born of fornication. What they're alluding to is the idea that Mary was pregnant before they were married. You see? So they're in, they're in this dialogue calling him a bastard. You follow me? Well, <laughs> Jesus picks up on that. And by the time you get to verse 44, he explains where their parentage comes from. He yeah. wants, you were of your father, the devil, who was a liar from the beginning and so forth. And so uh, the whole John 8 dialogue is uh, pretty intense. Don't let the politeness of the King James English hide the tension that's brewing there. It's a rather, rather amusing chapter. Um, and of course, Satan has enmity with man uh, from Genesis 3 on. But the real point I want to get at is as God begins to reveal his plan to redeem man. See, I have the view that Satan always regarded Adam as his rival. Because, in fact, Adam's going to inherit what Satan lost in a sense. So, um, uh, anyway, the point is when, when uh, in, um, as God begins to reveal his plan of redemption, it allows Satan to focus his plan to try to thwart the plan of God. And it starts with Adam and Eve. Uh, Satan has the seven heads, ten horns. That's, you'll, we'll, we'll cover that next time in Revelation 13. And also, in, it's in Daniel, from Daniel 7 and so forth. Um, it's interesting that... Uh, the prophecies of Daniel dovetail with Revelation so uh, skillfully. In Daniel chapter 8, it talks about the little horn. One of them came forth a little, we're talking about the horns there, and, and which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land, and waxed great even to the host of heaven. Now that's a strange passage because we're talking about Alexander and his generals here and so forth, except suddenly we, the, 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 the language shifts, up, shifts a notch, moves the decimal point over, so to speak. It waxed great even to the host of heaven and cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. This is a prophecy of the coming world leader, but I want you to notice that somehow it's going to bring down some of the angels. Spiritual warfare is the topic. We could digress for a whole evening on this one easily. If you're going to study background here, you would probably start in 2 Corinthians 2.11. You certainly want to... Uh, we, we touched a little bit on this in Revelation chapter 9 with the uh, fact that the, the locusts have no king and all of that. Uh, Ephesians 6 is your pivotal passage of the armor of God. And some of those allusions are not from the centurion that's chained to Paul. The centurion was chained to Paul so the centurion couldn't get away. Um, the allusions aren't from the centurion. It's from Isaiah 59 from the Old Testament, interestingly enough. But anyway, um, Elisha's servant gets a glimpse of the spirit world in 2 Kings 6. And I won't take the time here as we go to try to be, uh, let you get into those yourself. We know from Daniel 10 that there are spirit beings that are behind major empires. The, the uh, Persians and the Greeks are depicted there as being guided by, invisibly by the prince of the power of Persia and of Greece and so forth. The question that sort of begs, is there a prince of the power of the U.S.? 
probably. And I'm not talking about someone you, you would see walking down the street. I'm talking about a spirit being that's manipulating behind the scenes. And so as we watch this strange parade of paganism undermine this country's heritage, as we watch um, the eight major nations of our world endorse terrorism by giving three billion dollars to the Palestinian Authority and you're shocked not only because of the misdirection of the cash because of the corruption but what they're sending the message they're sending is that terrorism pays don't be surprised remind yourself whose who's, who, whose world is this it's Satan's and uh, we need to understand that and uh, you and I are not earth dwellers we're passing through we're pilgrims our destiny is elsewhere Satan's methods in Genesis chapter 3 is always deceit. His first thing is to create doubt about the Word of God. Yea, hath God said? Did he really say that? And once he gets you down that path, then he goes into direct denial. Ye shall not surely die, etc. But the same methods today. Deceit all the way through. To the ultimate lie that Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2. And I won't take the time here. We'll talk about that probably next week. But the ultimate victory, let's not lose sight that the ultimate victory is not his, it's ours. Satan is already defeated. And you can find plenty of scriptures to chase that one down as we go forward. And it's, even, and it's also climaxes our chapter tonight. I want you, to, though, to understand his stratagems. From the beginning, he sought to thwart the plan of God. When Cain murdered Abel, I believe Satan was behind that. The corruption of Adam's line by the Nephilim in Genesis 6. We've talked a lot about that. We've covered it in our Genesis commentary. But his attempt to corrupt the human race to, to prevent the emergence of a kinsman of Adam to re, be the Redeemer. As God begins to re reveal that he's going to work through Abraham, Satan is allowed then to focus his attack on Abraham and his descendants. The famine in Genesis 50. The destruction of the male line, or attempted destruction of the male line by Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 1. Even after he lets them go in the Exodus, he goes after them to destroy them in uh, Exodus 14. And uh, the population of Canaan, when, when God tells Abraham that four centuries later his descendants are going to come back to Canaan, that gives Satan four centuries to lay down a minefield. You need to understand what the Rephaim were really all about. God tells Joshua when you go into this land to wipe out every man, woman, and child of certain tribes. We read that as a New Testament reader. We can't handle it because we don't understand the problem. It's a gene pool problem. The same thing that was in Genesis 6 in a sense. But the populating of Canaan is part of it. You need to get into, into all of that. As God reveals that he's going to work through David's lines, every time he gives you more revelation, it allows Satan to focus his attack. So he focuses attack against David. And uh, Joram kills his brothers. The Arabians slew all but Hazariah. Athaliah kills all, but one small boy escapes by a servant, Joash. Hezekiah is assaulted in Isaiah 36 38. And the blood, finally, the blood curse on Jeconiah. You think that God has shot himself in the foot here because he pronounces a blood curse on the royal line. I bet you Satan had a celebration that day when that happened. And I think God turned to the angel and says, Watch this one. And you, as you follow that through, you understand the, the, the divergence of the bloodline and the house of the, the legal line. Uh, under, after Solomon dies, um, the, uh, the, legal, the, the legal regal line goes through Rehoboam and down through Joseph, the legal father of Jesus. But uh, Luke, being a doctor, takes the bloodline through Nathan, the second surviving son of Bathsheba, not the first, not, not uh, 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 Rehoboam, but uh, uh, a son called Nathan and follows it down to Mary, the blood. So the virgin birth solves that problem. And uh, then we get to the Persian period and Haman, who is a, a prefigure of Hitler in a sense, he, he tries to kill all the Jews of the Persian Empire. And through the escapades of Esther and so forth, of course, he gets thwarted. So again and again, we see Satan trying to thwart the plan of God. In the New Testament, Joseph fears that she's pregnant before they're married, and God deals with that. Herod attempts to kill the babes. Then at Nazareth, they tried to, when he announces the misery, they tried to throw him off a cliff. And then there's not one, but two storms at sea. And those storms are strange storms. If you've ever been on the Sea of Galilee, that's a mistranslation. It's not a sea, it's a lake. 
the early translators, Yom, does not see. It's a lake. But anyway, uh, uh, it's, it's not that big a place. You go, I mean, when I first saw it, I was, as, a, as a Naval Academy graduate, I was sort of surprised because you can't visualize a life-threatening storm on a lake that you can, I was trying to say, walk across. <laughs> <laughs> But there's two storms, that, and these are fishermen for whom these were native waters. And they were in fear of their lives. So something strange going, when, when Christ rebukes the sea, I submit to you, those were not just natural storms, something else was going on. And of course the ultimate strategy is the cross. I don't have to. And the summary of this whole thing is in Revelation 12. That's what it's all about. And the point of all this is Satan isn't through. Didn't st that's what chapter 13 is going to be about next week. And he's not through in your life and mine. He's still busy. And you won't understand what he's got to gain until you really understand his attempt to thwart the plan of God. Because there is a prerequisite condition to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Not the rapture, it could happen tonight. But there is a prerequisite condition for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that is that Israel has to repent and, and, and uh, ask him to return. And that's what Hosea 5, last verse, 15, talks about. God says, I will return to my place. He must, to return, he has to have left it. I will return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. That's singular and specific. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. That's what the Great Tribulation is all about. So thus, I finally, after many years, begin to understand. I could never figure out why Satan is still at it. I can understand what he's doing all the way through the Bible, but once the cross occurs, it's over. He's lost. Why is he still at it? Most people would argue just out of meanness, or he's just a, he's just a overgrown terrorist or something. Um, no, I suspect there's, in his mind there's a logic here. He, if he can wipe out the believing remnant, so they don't petition him to return. He's thwarted the plan of God. And in, in some strange way would consider himself vindicated. That's what it's all about. That's why he is focused, first of all, while we're here, on our productivity. He can't take your salvation away, but he can keep you from being productive. But his primary focus isn't on you and me. It's on the believing remnant. Not the Jew in general, the, Jew, the believing Jew especially. Revelation 12, verse 10, I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now is coming salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of the testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Wow. Praise God. How did they overcome? By his blood. Hebrews 9, 12. By the word of testimony. And the book of life is alluded in Exodus 32. In fact, Moses is so praying for his people that he's willing to forfeit his salvation on their behalf. If you remember that passage, Exodus 32, 32. But, uh, but uh, he'll be, they'd be blotted out of the book of life. Now it's, it's also alluded in Daniel 12. They love not their lives. That's, of course, the, the New Testament is full of that. And uh, in contrast, to, just like the two witnesses, it wasn't until their testimony was finished that it was finished. In Exodus 32, you may recall, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Can you imagine loving a people that much? I don't love you that much. I would not give up my salvation. I'm sorry to admit that to you. <laughs> Moses is not, I pray thee blot, I pray thee out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Ooh, heavy stuff. Also in Daniel 12, 1, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even at that same time. That's where we get the, Jesus is quoting this, that's where we get the great tribulation term. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. Praise God for that. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. 
Is your name in the book? Is your name written in the book of life? You should not be guessing about that. You need to be certain. You need to be more certain of that than anything else in your life. And you shouldn't leave this room without with having any doubt of where you stand with respect to God because your eternity can start when you leave the room on the way home. You don't have to wait for the rapture. You know, it's a, there was, what, what, a couple nights ago, there was one person in the group. I did have an altar call formally and so forth, but he was moved by our closing and he shared with some of his friends and he, he came to a decision for Christ. He was killed two days later. But he's with the Lord because he made that decision before he left this room. Revelation 12, 12, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. You and I are not inhabitants of the earth, I hope. We may be here, but earth dwellers in the book of Revelation are a, 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 a definitive group. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. You see, that's why I believe the rapture is a secret. Almost everything else in God's plan is visible some way if you do your homework. There's one mystery as to when the rapture, and I'm tired of people sending me manuscripts because they've figured it out. It's going to be a week from Tuesday or whatever. It's going to be in November. Great, I'll, I'll review your manuscript in December. Um, I believe the rapture is a secret because God wants to catch Satan by surprise. And I think the trigger for all these things is the rapture. And when Paul talks about in Romans 11.25 that Israel is blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, that tells me there is a number that God is looking for. There's a number in which the church is complete. It's full. It's not open-ended. There is a number he's looking for. When we have that number, it's full. It's complete. That's what the fullness of the Gentiles means. And when that number is complete, the Father says to the Son, go get him. Now that intrigues me because Satan knows that's true. He knows there's a counter somewhere in heaven. He doesn't know what the number is. He doesn't know where the counter is, but he knows there's a number that's reaching toward. Like one of these movies where you got the clocks cutting down before the bomb goes off kind of thing. See, I love this because every time somebody accepts Jesus Christ, somebody trusts the Lord Jesus Christ, a counter in heaven goes click. It goes, it's one, it's one closer to that completeness. And I love this because every time somebody accepts Jesus Christ, that counter moves one, and Satan doesn't know that that's the last one in. So every time someone accepts Christ, he's in shock. I love that. Satan has been in shock treatment for 1,900 years. <laughs> And what Satan's trying to do, he can't take, I don't think he can take away your salvation, but what he can do is keep you from being productive. He's trying to slow that counter down. Follow me? But that counter, one of you in this room, who have yet to accept Jesus Christ, may be holding all of us back. <laughs> you thought about that? I love that. So get with it, okay? <laughs> see, people ask me, is the, is the Antichrist, we're going to talk about the Antichrist next time. Is the Antichrist alive today? Absolutely. If you asked me that a hundred years ago, is the Antichrist alive then? I'd say, absolutely. How do I know? Not from the scripture exactly. Satan doesn't know when the starting gun is going to be fired. But when it does, he knows he's got a small window of opportunity. So he's had to have his man in the, in the window, in the wings, at the ready. No matter whether it was the first century or the 20th, first century. Follow me? So you can find, you could speculate candidates all through history. Who cares? Because I don't believe you can know who he is until after the rapture. That's what Second Thessalonians, so don't waste your time. But I do believe he's alive today. For lots of reasons, not just this one. But let's go on. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman. Really? Why? 
He persecuted, persecuting, the, persecuting the church? Not especially. Yes, but that's not, that, that's not his focus. Persecuting the woman, which brought forth the man-child. Why? Because he's, he's already out. Why, why is he doing this? And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness unto her place where she is nourished for time, times, half a time for the face of the servant. There is that same time period again. We're, we're moving towards the most documented period of time in the Bible. Now Israel's respite has always been involved with eagles and eagles' wings. Uh, in Exodus 19 and Deuteronomy 2, Exodus, uh, the eagles' wings from Egypt is the idiom they used to, on the Exodus. Uh, the wilderness, of course, and even from the return of Babylon, that same expression is used in Isaiah 40. The wilderness, of course, is another idiom that Jesus himself warns them about. And we notice, of course, that the, the wilderness region, which is east of, of, of uh, uh, Judea, uh, Edom, Moab, and Ammon escaped the Antichrist, strangely enough, for some weird reason. Daniel 11:41. Why? I suspect, don't know this, I suspect, it's to give them a, place, a refuge to flee to as the door of hope and so forth. We go on more about that. The earth swallows the enemies of God, apparently, in the, in the prophetically, and that's exactly what happened in number 16. Do you remember when they had the rebellion and the earth literally opened up and swallowed them up? I think that's prophetic. The serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Is that a diaspora? I don't know. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Ah, that's the point. Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Wow. There's a conflict between two seeds. We, all of us know the title of Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman from Genesis 3.15. We forget that there are two seeds in Genesis 3, the seed of the serpent. And that's the, the, the seed of the red dragon, Satan. He's going to have a, there's a coming world leader, a political power man, and a false prophet that caused the entire world to worship him. And many uh, writers point out that, and these, by the way, these are the forces behind the world today. Some people call this a satanic trinity. You've got Satan, the coming world leader, and the false prophet in the roles of, in a sense, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a, that's a parallel that some writers draw. But in any case, next time, chapter 13 is going to focus on Satan's two guys. Remember, the Antichrist is a duet, not one guy, it's two. Is he a Jew or Gentile? You can argue both ways. Maybe one is and the other is also. Uh, one of each, who knows. We'll take a look at that next time. So next time, I want you to read Revelation chapter 13, which introduces the satanic duet. The beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth. They're quite different. And um, there are background passages you may want to look into. The origin of Satan, of course, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Most of you should be familiar with that. The fact that he's an Assyrian is something most scholars overlook. Yes, he's out of the Roman Empire, but not out of Western Europe. He's, out of, he's an Assyrian according to Isaiah 10, Micah 5, and some other passages. We'll talk a little bit about that next time. And there is a physical description of him in the Bible. Zechariah 11, verse, the last verse of, uh, last verse of uh, Zechariah 11. So that's your challenge for next time. Uh, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we praise you for who you are. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, for going to such extremes that we might inherit an eligibility that we could never earn for ourselves. We thank you that each one of us derive our benefits from that covenant you gave Abraham so long ago. We thank you for that man-child, that he went in our place, that he was able and willing and effective at taking our place. We thank you, Father. We pray, Father, that you would increase in each of us an awe, an appetite, a hunger, for your word, that we each might grow in grace and the knowledge of him, that we each might be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities that are before us. We thank you this night, Father, as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation whatsoever. We 
commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.